Thanks. I'm very excited to share something with you today for the very first time. So it's a very, very new project, and I haven't presented this anywhere else yet. Um, so I'm a PhD student in experimental physics in Cambridge, and yeah, I want to tell you a bit about a project that I do together with some yeah, volunteers and professionals there. And also, for the last couple of minutes, I'm going to invite in Jenny, um, who organizes a lot of very cool open source hardware things around Cambridge. And she'll just share a few things with you afterwards as well. So uh, from my perspective, what open source hardware really is, in the end, is a good documentation that you're going to share. So you're doing something, and the aim is that you present this to others so that they can replicate the build. So now I'm, I'm just interested a little bit in, in your experiences. Who of you has tried to replicate someone else's project from scratch, just from a documentation. Hands up. OK, several people. So who found that easy to do? Who found that the documentation gave them exactly what they needed? <laughs> no one. Good, that's what, I, that's what my experience is too. I tried many projects. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we decided that what we really need is a documentation tool that helps you do documentations that make the project also hackable. Not only um, that you can assemble a kit that someone sells to you, because these instructions might be OK, but if you don't have all the components on your table, then that's usually really hard. OK, um, but first, I'll talk a little bit about open source hardware in science, because I find that to a lot of people, this seems to be a new um, concept even within science, and a bit of examples what what happens there, and then yeah, why are we we're doing this? So it's not just that we came up with something, wh what do we do in our free time, but we came across this from our work on open source hardware, and we just say, well, there isn't a tool that we need, so let's build it. OK, so um, I'm going to start by just showing a couple of examples. And I do have quite a lot of examples, so this is more or less a random selection of things that I'm going to show you to give you an impression what's what open source hardware could be good, in, uh, good at in science. So this is a 3D printed open source microscope, and I'm going to build 10 of them with you tomorrow in the workshop for whoever is interested. Um, so you have the XYZ axis, is all 3D printed with some screws inside, and you can position the sample holder with one micron precision, and then just plug a, a Raspberry Pi with a Raspberry Pi camera to it. And there you have a digital microscope. You can also motorize the stage and so on. That's very cool. A colleague of mine, Richard Bowman, invented this. There are also other open source microscopes that can be quite interesting. So um, this is from a group in Germany, in Tübingen, Tom Baden and Andre Chagas, who developed this open source fluorescence microscope. And then there's this year's iGEM team. So that's a synthetic biology competition, international one, at the hosted at the MIT. And our team has forked Richard's microscope, this one, into a fluorescence microscope that's upright. So these are quite neat, and what a microscope is for is quite obvious. But there are a couple of other things that are quite nice. For example, a potentiostat. So this is for electrochemical measurements. If you have several electrodes in water to see what happens you know, with different chemicals, reaction potentials, and so on, you can measure. And these are incredibly expensive. So we need a lot of these in our lab as well. And they oftentimes cost many thousand pounds for one channel. And this one is also below 100 pounds, I think. Someone published this. There is this team at the MIT that produce a little syringe pump. You can just uh, pop in a couple of syringes there. And you can drive your microfidic devices, again, for high throughput um, chemistry or biology experiments. And then there are a couple of projects like these that we're trying to recreate with another project in Cambridge at the moment. So these are all different designs for um, an open source thermocycler. So this is for um, DNA amplification and a little centrifuge and an open source pipette and a few other things. So these are instructions that are already out there. And we wanted to look at them to see how easy it is to build them, whether all the information is there and uh, to characterize them to see if they would meet the scientific standard that you would need in a lab. Um, however, it turns out it's extremely hard to replicate these projects. And now I feel it would have been easier to start from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> there is also IronScope, which is um, 
yeah, um, a company near Cambridge who wants to open source some of their microscopy components. And there is Iordeo, which is a company in the US that sells little stirrers and uh, gel electrophoresis box. They're quite nice, and I think they give quite good instructions too. Um, one thing that's also really difficult about these projects is they're all hosted on their individual websites. So if you don't do intensive, many, many days and weeks internet research like I did, then there's little chance that you would know all of them. So um, it's another problem we're trying to solve. This is uh, Open Epiphys. So this is for electrophysiology experiments, just different ports you would usually need and, and hardware boards to make this a lot easier. And then there is another cool project from the, uh, from the Boston US environment. That's the Open Trans. That's an open source pipetting robot. They had their um, hardware on Kickstarter as well, and they just shipped all the all the different components. And then the Shipoku X Cave. That's a, um, a CNC router, basically, and that's an open source hardware piece as well. And the Open Trans is based on the Shipoku. So there you can see how nicely you can use open source hardware as well to do a completely different piece of equipment. And then there are quite different things that are not really in the scientific sphere. And what I'm speaking of in the rest of my talk is not all scientific projects. So this applies to all sorts of different projects. And what they have in common is that they're relatively complex and they're on, on an integration level. So I think, well, open source software, of course, has come a long way. And also open source hardware electronics. There are some tools and standards there that are decent. I'd say I'm not an electronics person, but that's my first impression. However, when you want to put together very different kinds of pieces, electronics and, and mechanical components and so on, then how do you describe that and communicate that? Well, that's a big question. So there's an open source beehive. So you can, with a CNC router, you can build your own beehive. And they've made some really cool kits where you can monitor environmental data and upload that to a crowd for um, beehives dying in the environment to see how that matches with different um, um, fermenting, or how do you say, um, well, poisonous that are sprayed around the, the fields, basically, that also kill the bees, how these uh, coincide and so on. Okay, so basically, um, well, I think few of you are scientists, and this doesn't only apply to science, but I think it's a, it's a shame that open source hardware is not very popular yet, in science, but I see a lot of potential in using open source for science because in science almost every setup is a prototype. And that's what open source hardware is really good at. It's not for making large stacks, but it's building one piece that does something and then adapting the next one. And that's exactly what every scientist does all the time. Well, not every scientific, uh, scientific, scientific setup, but almost <coughs> every one. And um, also scientists need to show their impact, so they need to actually bring this out and need to prove that people are using it. So unfortunately, there aren't really good ways of tracking that for open source hardware. This is why open source hardware doesn't give you a lot of impact in the traditional scientific credit structure, unfortunately. But I hope this is also slowly changing, and it is actually, because the, in the European Commission, for example, they're thinking about different rules of how to count impact how to reevaluate how good a scientist is. But essentially, that's what they want to do. They want to bring it out. So it's great for open source hardware. Um, they have a lot of diff different technological training, and it's a very large community. So if we could launch open source hardware better in the scientific community, then both of them could, could bring a good benefit. And this should be linked, of course, to everybody else who wants to do open source hardware, too. So it's publicly available. Um, but as I said, at the moment, it's not really rewarded enough in science. And since it's not really rewarded, but it's a lot of effort to document this properly and publish it, not a lot of people do it. And a lot of people don't really know what to do with it. So I showed you these example projects, but very few people are aware of it. OK, so what are we doing to solve some of these problems? Because I want this to flourish. So I found a couple of people who are helping me to build DocuBricks. <coughs> so on docubricks.com, you can find a database that's already fully operational. I mean, we'll add lots of features. This is the very first release. And during the weekend, there will also be the link put up to download our first software release on um, this documentation. Summit. I'll just launch it briefly to show you a bit what it looks like and what you can do with it. And well, I said in my official title that it's, it's going to be a fun documentation standard. So maybe it's not strictly speaking going to be fun, but it's definitely going to be fun compared to and other ways of documenting things, especially Word. Um, 
So it's, it's definitely going to be a lot less painful. And also, we want to spare people to have to go through the whole process of thinking about what makes a good documentation, but we want to guide them a little bit to make something that's modular. So if you have different things that are integrated, electronics, mechanicals, whatsoever, you're trying to solve different problems, if we just think about a 3D printer, how many different types of controls there are and problems that are solved, if this was described in a more modular way, then you could easily rebuild this, but then replace some of these solutions while you go along and use others. And pays an emphasis on functions. So describe, you might have lots of different sprules, screws, but some of them, like here, might be um, to adjust something with a very high precision. Some of them might just hold pieces together. Um, or, yeah, they might have completely different functions or to just give a bit of rigidity to a structure. So it's important to let the reader know what you're trying to achieve with your solution. So the actual project is just one implementation of what you're trying to solve. So that's the, the mind frame of how we're structuring this. And um, we have a database, and again, for the scientists, it's quite interested that it's, it's a citable database, so you'll be able to request a DOI, a digital object identifier, for your documentation if you want, which means that you get a link that's curated by an international organization. That's how all scientific journals handle um, uh, publications. So it means that even if we'd have to close down our database, um, we would then have to tell them where this information can still be found and the link will be redirected. So this will be forever findable under that DOI. And this is something you can cite in a paper. So you can describe your project and say where to find all the instructions about it. And yeah, there will be a new journal as well about open source hardware that we're collaborating with. So um, this is anyways a collaboration with a lot of people in, in Cambridge and also with Luca Mustafa, who is a Shuttleworth fellow. And um, he already had this idea a bit earlier than we actually to do, to make a documentation that's modular. That's one of his graphics from his, from his website. And also reuse of project modules. So this is where the licensing also becomes quite interesting. So you might just take a solution from a different project that might have a different license. Uh, and it will keep that license. But how do you frame that into a bigger project and so on? So there are lots of interesting questions still to look at and solve, but I'm quite optimistic that we're going to find a good solution. And the open platform that Jenny is going to mention is uh, supporting that project. OK, what else is going on? Uh, yeah, I'm going to show you the software in a second uh, after the presentation. But um, we do a couple of more projects in the Cambridge area, so we have a big competition. We want to encourage scientists <coughs> to document the setups that they have already built, because a lot of scientists do that. They build their own stuff in the lab. So we hope that they document some of that and submit it to our competition and then publish it open source. And I already mentioned that we review some of the equipment that's on the internet to see how good it does for scientific use. OK, so yeah, these are a lot of great people, mainly postdocs and PhD students, who work on this with uh, me on a volunteering basis. Um, some are hired, and we had a little bit of funding to get some of this going. OK, so let me show you Where's the mouse. There it is. This is the database. So I told you it's very new. So actually, there isn't really a project on there yet. But um, we will have a lot of very exciting projects in the next few weeks. One of them is this microscope documentation that's up there. So this microscope, if you're interested as well, um, this the paper draft has already been submitted to archive, so it's on the internet, and I printed out a couple that I'll bring along tomorrow. Um, but the real documentation hasn't been published yet, and this will all be on this website with a couple of other interesting things. But it's all ready for the operational, so you can log in and submit your project. Um, so maybe the CNC router or something, that would be something uh, the CNC control would be very interesting, for example, to have as well. So it's not limited to science. OK, and the software, so unfortunately, this link here. Oh, it does now. Great, fantastic. So now you can download the software and try it out. And please give it lots of feedback. So this is the first beta version that we release. OK, and this is what the software looks like. Oh, here we have it. Okay, so it hasn't been designed nicely, but it's functional. So um, yet, at least. OK, so. What we, what we have in there essentially 
is that we have a bill of materials. Can you see that nicely? It's a bit difficult. And with a mouse as well. <laughs> okay, so we have a bill of materials here. Um, there. Not complete on the screen. Here we go. And uh, so you put in the parts that you're using, basically. We'll also provide a feature soon where you can upload a spreadsheet of your materials into that. But you can also attach pictures and some manufacturing instructions. For example, if you 3D print something, you might want to go in different holes with a drill and make it a bit more precise or something, if that's necessary. You describe that all under the part. And then um, you have bricks, so that's how it's modular, and that's why we call it docu-bricks. So you have lots of different bricks, and they're in a tree hierarchy. So you say in your top brick, that's the Curusa project, um, what you're exactly trying to achieve, and then you add <coughs> the different functions that it does, and in which brick you describe that further, and then you, yeah, you just add these bricks and um, yeah, describe what they do and then what parts are contained in this brick. So then you get a, a tree hierarchy. So this is only the um, free and open source offline documentation software where you put in the information and then you uh, get it as an output an XML <coughs> document and you have your folder with all the files in there. And that is what you can upload to the database. You can host the whole thing on GitHub while you're developing it, and you can also put this anywhere else. So you, it's not that you have to put it on the database, but of course it would be nice if you want to share it. And um, then you view this, and the first version of our viewer, so this is, as I said, it's very new, so we're still working a bit on, on the design and the usability, but uh, essentially you're then viewing the whole XML document, so this is also offline, um, and then you can here in the tree jump to the different modules, but essentially you can also just scroll down and you have the whole project here. And so the main benefit of this is to understand um, how the project is built. So you see the modules, the different solutions that you're trying to solve and how they're solving it. If you, are, if you supply a kit to someone, then it's a much more linear process to just put together all the parts. If that's what you're trying to do, then you probably want to view these in a different orders and you only want to have the instructions. And um, this is also something that's going to be included in our uh, next release that you'll be able to, cr to define a path through your instructions that this will be displayed in case you're already providing parts, for example, because that's different from hacking a project from scratch, if, if that difference is clear to everybody.